All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Orlando Museum of Arts Cultural Conversations, reflections on our current exhibition. Uh, thank the Mex uh, sorry, Lucis de Sombras from the Mexican Photography from the Bank of America collection. I'm David Madison. I'm the OMA's Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. Um, and before we begin, I just want to remind everyone of the features of our Zoom classroom. If you would please place your questions for our speaker uh, in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your toolbar, we'll address those at the end of today's program. And I have the honor of introducing our speaker this evening. Um, Elizabeth Ferrer is the chief curator at BRIC, a multidisciplinary arts organization in Brooklyn, as well as a scholar of Latinx and Mexican photography. She is the author of Lola Alvarez Bravo, published by Aperture and named a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, as well as numerous exhibition catalogs published in the US and Mexico. Her most recent book is Latinx Photography in the United States, A Visual History, which was published by the University of Washington Press this past January. Ferrer has also curated major exhibitions at institutions, including the Smithsonian Institution, Notre Dame University, El Museo del Barrio, the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia University, and the America Society in New York. She studied art history at Wellesley College and at Columbia University. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wish I could be with you all in person, but Zoom is the next best thing. So I want to thank everybody for, for being here. And I want to thank the uh, entire team um, at uh, the museum for putting together this show and this great series of programs. Um, I think it's um, a really exciting opportunity to get an, an outstanding uh, introduction to Mexican photography. The, the Bank of America collection is, um, is really superb. Uh, I was very impressed when I began to dig into it. So I thought I would begin um, by telling you a little bit about myself and my background with uh, Mexican photography, uh, just to basically explain why I have such a passion for this work. So this takes us way back to the mid and late uh, 1980s after I had finished my education and moved to New York and had this dream to be a curator. I was very green. I uh, didn't really know what I was doing back then, but um, I uh, also at the same time was realizing that I knew very little about my own heritage. And this was at a time when it was uh, difficult to study Latinx or even Latin American art in college. They're just, they're, the coursework wasn't available the way it is today. So I just decided I'd go to Mexico and I would give myself this self-education. So I went and I started to go to all the museums and then to the galleries and alternative spaces. I began to introduce myself to the, the gallerists and I just found this um, remarkable art scene there, very different very different from what I was seeing in New York, you know, very authentic, very fresh, compelling. It spoke to me in terms of my own sort of search in terms of what I wanted to be as a curator. You know, this was a time when there was a lot of work about, about national identity, cultural identity. And so I decided that would be what I would specialize in. I would distinguish myself that way as a curator with, with, with Mexican art. And um, I curated one big show that traveled around the country and that took me back to Mexico. And then what I really discovered was the photography. And, you know, I thought that the art was great and I, I still do, but when I began to, to get the, this introduction to both historic and contemporary photography, I was, I was blown away. I feel like Mexico has one of the great legacies of 20th century photography as is represented in this exhibition. And I decided I wanted to work with that. So I started to meet the photographers. I found them to be very uh, generous with their time and with introductions to other photographers and yeah, I eventually began to curate exhibitions of photography and also work on books with these, with these photographers as catalog essays. Uh, so I have a long history with many of the photographers that we're gonna be looking at in a minute. And you know, I've, I've loved them as, as craftspeople so dedicated to the medium of photography, to the technical aspects of photography, but the work that they make, the way that they reveal a Mexico that they think is underlooked and, and what these photographs, what, what these photographs represent in terms of people who don't have, you know, really agency voice. I just find them very incredibly committed um, to their, to, to the medium. And so I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to show this work with you, uh, to you and uh, 
I hope we'll also be able to have a, a discussion about it later. You know, the exhibition is very large. So I think I decided early on when I got this invitation to speak to not to try to cover the entire exhibition. Instead, what I'm gonna do is talk about some of the women photographers in the show. And I think as you'll see, women remarkably are really some of the great photographers, not only in Mexico, but of the world. They've just, they've just really led the way in Mexico and are responsible for some wonderful work that we'll see. So we can uh, move to the next slide. And what I really wanna do for a moment though, is kind of go back to the beginning because to understand what a lot of this work is about, I think we need to talk a little bit about Mexican history. So this is, we're gonna talk about Mexican modern history and I'm gonna be very, very simplistic about this. But basically Mexican history, modern history begins uh, around 1920 at the conclusion of the Mexican revolution. So the revolution was this decade long chaotic series of battles that was really about uh, overthrowing a, a dictator who had uh, led Mexico, ruled Mexico with an iron fist for decades. And it was about a more equitable way of uh, dealing with uh, a massive peasant class that had been greatly exploited under, under this dictatorship. So when the revolution was won, um, this, what happened was that land was redistributed, campesinos began to get land. And it, it, it's very complicated in terms of politics, but from the sort of cultural and social point of view, what's important to think about is the way that Mexico actually put this incredible um, focus on indigenous people and on tradition. You know, this, the, the reality is that it's, it's fairly complicated. You know, indigenous people remain poor and in many ways remained exploited, but they were upheld as sort of the, the heart of Mexican culture. And there was in the 1920s a, a drive um, among uh, intellectuals and politicians to think about what Mexican identity could be. Um, there was a purging of this European influence that had been very important in the last decades of the 19th century. And there was the desire to be truly Mexican. And so this idea of Mexicanidad, what it is to be Mexican came to the fore for artists and intellectuals. And for me, that's really fascinating because I can't really think of a time in American history when the entire country has come together for us to think about what it is to be American and then to make art. That, re that reflects that idea. But this is what happened in Mexico in the 1920s and 30s. I think the best known manifestation of this is, is, the, is the murals, but it happened in music, it happened in dance, um, it happened in literature. And so the photographers that begin to work in the 1920s are what kind of comes out of this, this environment. And I think we only need to look at, you know, this is just one small segment of a major mural cycle by Diego Rivera in the National Palace. And we see how indigenous people have become sort of, you know, mythologized. Um, you know, this is the kind of work that's being made in Mexico, especially in the 1920s and 1930s. And this kind of focus on indigenous people and on traditions and going back to Mexico and its, its native culture is what informs a lot of the, not, not necessarily the direct subject matter, but the ethos of what, excuse me, of what Mexican photographers were doing. So I think we can look at the next slide. And then what we're gonna do first though, is look at a couple of American photographers. So this is Edward Weston, who is a photographer originally from Los Angeles and his companion, Tina Madoti. I also want you to take a look at that big camera because a lot of the work that you're gonna see made in the 1920s and 1930s, it's made with this kind of uh, you know, big camera with the glass plates. So being a photographer at this time you know, is no easy task. Uh, there was a, you know, a lot of skill that was needed and a lot of training to be able to use these cameras well. But um, to get back to Edward Weston, so he was a fairly successful um, studio photographer in Los Angeles. Um, he had a busy portrait practice and um, he was also getting kind of very weary of what, what he was doing. He kind of needed this space to reinvent himself. Um, he was also carrying on an affair with Tina Madotti, who was an Italian silent screen actress who lived in Los Angeles. So in 1923, the two went together uh, to Mexico. Um, Mexico became this incredibly important interlude for uh, Edward Weston. He pretty much you know, recreated his style, which had been what was known as pictorialism. So this sort of soft focus type of photography that was aiming to replicate painting because painting was the most valued kind of art 
And uh, in Mexico, he really moved away from that to a more direct, sharp style focus. He talked about uh, wanting to capture the quintessence of the thing itself. And then while in Mexico, he also, Madodi became his assistant, but he also trained Madodi to use the camera. And then she was very important in Mexico as well, which you'll see in a minute, because she injected this more humanist voice into this kind of very rigorous modern style. And so both of these photographers really kind of lay the groundwork for what modern photography would be in Mexico beginning in the 1920s. Um, let's look at a work by Edward Weston, and this is one of the works in the show. So Weston and Madodi, they, they got to know the Mexican cultural community. It was fairly small and tight uh, back in those days. We're talking about, you know, really celebrate people like uh, Diego Rivera, Orozco, Frida Kahlo. Uh, there would be these excursions with picnics and drinking, and one of those excursions took Madodi and Weston to Teotihuacan. This is one of the largest uh, pyramids quite near Mexico City. Um, it has been photographed a lot. There's a whole history of photographer explorers, both Europeans and Americans, who came to Mexico to document uh, these archaeological ruins. But in Weston's eyes, what we see is this sort of massive form. It's really a study in form in you know, gradations of, of tone from the deepest black to rich grays. And it really, um, I think, represents that um, idea of Weston's to you know, think about the quintessence of the form itself. And that also plays into this um, uh, environment in Mexico of wanting to celebrate its uh, indigenous heritage. Um, if we go to another slide. So this is a slightly later work. Uh, by Weston of a, you know, not, not so much a monumental form, but a smaller form, a, a study of cactus. And again, we see Weston photographing on, directly on form, you know, really turning the, the cactus into a kind of abstraction, uh, which he loved to do. Uh, and he loved to look at the different tones in something, of course, he's, he's translating everything into black and white. We can, we'll look at one more. This is another uh, pyramid in Cuernavaca, which is uh, about an hour or so south of Mexico City. And I think what you see in all these three images is the absence of people. Um, Weston liked to work in his studio. Uh, one of the photographs that he's most well known for in Mexico is of a toilet seat, which actually became this very important key work in the way that modernism was being uh, conceived by Weston. Uh, he would photograph Mexican toys, ollas, or big black clay pots. Very rarely would he photograph people unless he was uh, doing a studio portrait. But I think we do have one portrait. I think that's the next. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, okay, let's, let's stick on the next. Well, we can we can stay here. We we can go back to the hands. So um, and, and you know and that was Weston was a was a purist. He was a formalist. But he taught Madodi, as I mentioned, to use the camera, and she took those lessons. I think in such an interesting way, because I think she continues with. Weston's dictum, to, to think about form, to capture form. But she does it with this very humanist way. So in this image of workers' hands from the mid 1920s, you know, she's capturing all those details of the hands, the kind of mud and dirt on the, on the fingers, you know, the, the well-worn hands and the well-worn, you know, shovel or implement that, that he has. And, you know, with, and with this very, these very minimal means, Madodi is telling us what it is like to be a manual laborer in Mexico. So I think it's, it's, for me, it's just so interesting the way as a very young photographer, very new, she was able to translate Weston's ideas into something very different. And I think we have, and then we have one more by Madori, really, I, this is one of my favorite photographs. I think it is uh, so beautiful, woman from Tehuantepec. So I'm gonna be mentioning Tehuantepec a couple times in this talk. It's a, it's a town in the south of, in Southern Mexico on the Pacific coast. And a lot of um, artists and intellectuals flocked to Tehuantepec in the 1930s, 1920s and 30s. It's known for a place that really clung to tradition. It's known for a matriarchal culture where women wear these kind of elaborate uh, woven textiles. And you know, here again, uh, Madodi captures this, this woman in a, I think in kind of a majestic way, but it's also a very formal photograph. You know, you really appreciate the forms of this bowl you know, the form of her figure and the upraised arm. Um, and again, we see, you know, Madodi so interested in, in everyday people and in indigenous people and wanting to work with them as she works with the camera. We can move ahead, please. 
So with that background, uh, we can now move to talking about some you know, native born Mexican photographers. And the first and certainly one of the greatest is Manuel Alvarez Bravo. So uh, Manuel was born in 1902 in Mexico City. Uh, he died in 2002, so he lived to be a centenarian. And um, he had a, a remarkable career and a remarkable life. He grew up poor. Uh, he grew up in a, pen, in a tenement in a, in a large family in the center of Mexico City. He talks about remembering as a child, hearing the, the guns and the rifles from the Mexican Revolution. And sometimes as a child encountering uh, the bodies of dead soldiers in the streets near his house. Um, his family was quite cultured, despite the fact that they were quite poor. Uh, he, he knew about the arts, he knew about music, and as a teenager, he gravitated to photography. And, you know, he read European photo magazines that an uh, older photographer gave him. So he's pretty much self-taught as a photographer. Uh, this is a uh, portrait of him made by his wife for a while, Lola Alvarez Bravo. This is when they were living in Oaxaca, when Manuel was just starting out as a photographer. We can go to the next uh, image. So this is a, a photograph um, uh, by, uh, by Manuel Alvarez Bravo from about 1930. Um, and for me, it's, it's really uh, a very lovely picture because I think that for Manuel, it represented something about his youth. You know, I think that this girl leaning on this railing is, is kind of connoting very much the kind of environment that he grew up with as, as a child. But also, uh, what you have to re what you have to understand about Alvarez Bravo is that you know he's not romanticizing or um, being sentimental about something like this. He's really turning this photograph, this person, into a symbol. So this girl could connote you know useful longing, uh, the need to detach from one's surroundings, and that becomes Alvarez Bravo's gift. the The idea of taking these very everyday moments things that he would see in his local environment in Mexico City, and then transform them into these larger stories, into these poetic passages. Uh, these photographs become metaphors for something very universal. He's also very interested in poetry. So he's always thinking about sort of words when he's uh, making these photographs and, and evoking these kind, of, you know, very, these kind of like haiku or short stories about these people. The next slide, please. So for, so for example, the idea of the way that words are important, uh, titles are very important to, to Alvarez Bravo. Uh, this photograph is called Portrait of the Eternal. And here he's photographing uh, an artist that he knew, you know, very much using the, this uh, shaft of light to highlight her hair and part of her figure and her dressing gown. So, you know, on the one hand, this is this very intimate moment of a woman, you know, preparing for the morning, combing her hair. But it really becomes more than that, right? Because it is portrait of the eternal. So he's using light in this very symbolic way. He's thinking about female body, uh, about, about female beauty. And you know, there's a lot of psychologic, psychological complexity here as this woman gazes into the mirror, you know, she's sort of gazing into the future. I think there's also a level of eroticism in, in an image like this. And you know, in this image, this is um, quite a posed image uh, that Manuel Alvarez Bravo constructed. With an, with an artist acquaintance friend. You know, a lot of other things he kind of takes because he's just in the center of Mexico City and he sees things and he, you know, and he photographs things as, he, as he's moving along. And this is an example of that kind of work. So this is um, Optico Moderna from 1930. Um, Mexico City is changing a lot. I know, I know to us, this probably still looks, you know, very vintage, but um, after the revolution, Mexico begins to modernize, you know, it's getting, electricity, it's getting phones, there are all these wires, you know, in the upper floors of buildings, uh, a lot of new businesses opening. And, uh, you know, and this one for me is so interesting because Alvarez Bravo prints it intentionally in reverse. You see that all the, the words, you know, modern optics, you see, you see it all in reverse. And um, you also see all of these eyes, you know, a sort of eyes looking at us, eyes looking down the street. And so I feel like for this work becomes Alvarez Bravo's metaphor on, on the act of seeing, you know, what are we, what is he seeing as a photographer? And, you know, what is looking back at him? And isn't photography all about, about sight? So I think that he took advantage of finding this storefront to tell a little bit about himself and his craft and what he was doing when he was making a, a photograph. And then he also made studio portraits. You know, when, one of the things that we don't always talk about with these photographers who became so, become so well-known 
is that you know back in the 20s, 30s, really until the 1960s and 70s, very few photographers, whether in the United States or in Mexico, were making a living out of their work. Um, they were making prints and occasionally selling them, but for you know pennies compared to what these photographs go for now. Um, so one of the things that was very common is that these photographers made portraits. Uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo was part of this very uh, tight social circle. You know, he knew uh, he knew Frida Kahlo and he knew all the great muralists. So this is uh, 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 this is Alvarez Bravo's uh, studio portrait of Frida Kahlo, which is very beautiful. You know, you see her in all her regalia. You know, it's a very you know composed photograph, and um, you know I think that it shows Alvarez Bravo as a, as a photographer of uh, of great elegance. Um, one thing that I wanted to also mention about Alvarez Bravo is I'm and as I'm showing you all of these photographers, is that there's just this very interesting lineage. So um, you know Edward Weston was in Mexico in the 1920s uh, for just a few years. He returned back to California, actually back to his wife. And you know, resumed his career there, and Madodi, and Madodi stayed. But um, Alvarez Bravo never met uh, Weston, but he knew he knew Tina Madodi, and Madodi sent a packet of his photographs to Weston, and Weston wrote back and encouraged him. And it was and so between that and between working with Madodi, actually using Madodi's cameras, um, you know, so there's this influence that goes from uh, all from Weston to Madodi and now to Manuel Alvarez Bravo. And then I think what we're gonna look at next is Lola Alvarez Bravo. So I'm sorry for the, the quality of this, this photograph, but um, I think it's a very uh, beautiful picture of Lola. Um, Lola was born, I think about 1903. So very much a contemporary of Manuel. Um, and as I mentioned, they were married. So Lola, was, Lola has a fascinating story. Um, Lola was born into immense wealth. Uh, she recalls as a child traveling with her father in a private train car. Uh, they lived in a, a, a building in Mexico, the center of Mexico City, that was, you know, essentially a, a mansion, kind of a small palace. But then her father dies. Her mother was out of the picture for mysterious circumstances. But her father dies unexpectedly, and she is sent to live with relatives, uh, relatives who live in the same tenement building as Manuel Alvarez Bravo. So they meet as teenagers. Uh, they explore the city together. They hang out on the rooftop of this tenement together and uh, they marry and uh, they're only married for about a decade. But I think this picture is also taken in Oaxaca uh, that where they spent some, some formative years. Um, like uh, Edward Weston, Latina Madodi, Manuel taught Lola how to use the camera. At first he taught her to be his darkroom assistant. Uh, he needed somebody to develop his film and make his prints, but she really wanted to use the camera. She had to really kind of beg him to use the camera and he finally relented. And then she became a photographer in her own right. So we can look at the, the next uh, image. So Lola really needed to make a living. You know, they, had, they were only married for about 10 years. And when they divorced, she kept the name and she began to photograph for government agencies. And um, this, so she would travel all over Mexico, often photographing cultural events. I believe that when she made this uh, image, uh, which is entitled uh, Entero in Yalalag or uh, Internment in Yalalag, uh, she was there in this very isolated um, uh, highlands town in Oaxaca to photograph traditional dances. And she was uh, visiting somebody and heard this music and looked out the door of this very modest house and saw this funeral procession pass. So she immediately got out her camera and took this picture. And for me, what's so fascinating about it when we think in light of uh, a figure like Manuel Alvarez Bravo, who was her teacher, is that Lola really um, emphasized the cinematic. She also wanted to be a filmmaker. And you know, in that machismo society of Mexico in the 1930s and 40s, that, that really was impossible. Although I do believe Lola was able to make one film uh, rather late in her career. So even though she didn't have access to film cameras, she had that sensibility. And one of the things that I love about this photograph is you just really sense that slow movement of the people, that, that really heavy sense of mourning as they pass by the, the photographer. And this is a, a work by her from the 1940s. Uh, these are a couple more photographs by Lola. I think that one of her gifts was to create these little vignettes, again, 
thinking about cinema. There's for me, there's always a, a sense that there's something that comes you know right before these photographs and right after. And they often tend to be very kind of simple incidents. So for example, in the one on the left, this is a, a marketplace scene. It's called La Espina. And the man is removing a, a thorn or something from his foot. So the most mundane little act, but she imbues the photograph with this little this sort of little drama. And I think what's also beautiful about it is that she's asking us to look at these people. You know, again, we're looking at indigenous people who, you know, they tend to be rather invisible. They're the, the market sellers, they're the maids. And she, but she's saying, look at this, look at, look at, look at this, these two beautiful people. And the same thing with the photograph on the right, you know, that that man is peering around the corner and you know there's something else going on over there. So you get this sense of, of du there's this duration of quality to the photograph. Uh, this one is called, uh, Can Anyone Hear Me? And we can move on. Uh, Lola also, uh, Lola Alvarez Bravo. And I, I, I refer to a lot of these photographers by their first name because I, I knew them. Um, so I will, I will call her Lola. Um, she also knew Frida Kahlo very well. Um, what I think is interesting in, in this relationship is that they were really intimate friends. And, you know, they were, of course, uh, female friends. I think that when Lola Alvarez Bravo photographs Frida Kahlo, there's this level of intimacy and vulnerability that you don't find in the more studied, refined portraits by Manuel Alvarez Bravo. I think that when you see these uh, portraits of Frida by Lola, it, it really brings, in, brings out the psychic pain um, th I mean, this one is, again, very beautiful, and we see her very dressed with all of her uh, jewelry, but there's also a series of uh, photographs that uh, Lola made of Frida in the very last year of her life, I think it's 1956, and she really opened up herself to, to Lola, allowing her to be seen in pain, to be seen, you know, in her bed, um, and, you know, very close to death, uh, so it, it was an, a remarkable friendship. One, uh, one of the reasons that Lola is, is very important in this story is because she's influential as a photographer and she's also influential as a teacher. So we're gonna move to the mid 20th century and to this photographer who's very well represented in this exhibition, uh, Mariana Yampolsky. Uh, Mariana was born in 1926 in Chicago. Uh, she went to the Art Institute of Chicago. She was studying to be an artist. And you know, a lot of, a lot of um, artists and intellectuals were, were traveling to Mexico in the 1920s and 30s, and even into the 40s when, when uh, Mariana came. You know, Edward Weston could be seen as the vanguard of that movement of um, artists wanting to come to Mexico to uh, experience this more bohemian environment, this very progressive uh, political and cultural environment. But Mariana came in the, in the 1940s. She was very uh, progressive liberally. Uh, very progressive and liberal, and she wanted to become a printmaker and become involved with something called the Diario de Grafica Popular. And as you can see, I'm showing you an image at that time, uh, soon after her arrival in Mexico, and then much later in life uh, at the period when I knew her. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, Mariana wanted to be a, a printmaker. Uh, the Diario de Grafica Popular, or the uh, uh, popular uh, printmaking studio or workshop, uh, was very influential, very important in Mexico in the 1930s, 40s, uh, even in following decades. Um, they made a lot of sort of uh, practical everyday work. You know, they would make uh, political campaign posters. Uh, they would uh, create posters for vaccine drives. They did a lot of work around literacy, which was one of the, the big um, drives uh, after the Mexican Revolution. Uh, in this work, you see uh, a print illustrating their actual work. So this is uh, an image of the inside of, of one of the Dyer studios. And I'm drawn to it because Mariana was one of the few women who were involved. Um, she actually became its curator and sent uh, exhibitions of work by the Dyer printmakers all over the world. When you look at the list, it's amazing. You know, these exhibitions went to Scandinavia, to India, all over Latin America, to the United States. And I, I'm just intrigued by the fact that there is this woman in this uh, picture, uh, which you can see kind of at the middle to the left. And I, I just can't believe that this is not Mariana uh, working on one of her prints. Uh, but we can move on. And then uh, late in the 1940s and into the 1950s, she began to study uh, photography in a night class with Lola Alvarez Bravo. It's another thing that Lola did to make money. She taught night courses in photography. 
Uh, Mariana originally studied photography because she wanted to uh, document the work of the taller. It was a it was a very busy workshop, and you know they were always having exhibitions and events. Um, and she did that, but she began to realize that uh, photography could also be this very important medium for her, you know, and for art's sake. She also saw photography as a more up-to-date medium uh, to, to use. So increasingly, and certainly by the 1960s, uh, she really uh, moved away from printmaking into photography. And this is one of her first mature photographs, We Build at the Bar of 1962. And uh, the, um, the Wipilta at the bar is actually this brilliant white head covering that you see um, as this woman walks away from the, the camera frame. I think it's a really interesting photograph in the way that it it, it is so, uh, the way that it so starkly captures these contrasts of light and dark, you know, these very deep uh, stark shadows. And if you look in the uh, lower uh, left corner, you also see Mariana's shadow. So this is a work by uh, a somewhat young, uh, inexperienced photographer, um, although very important for her because it really establishes the two themes that were to inform uh, much of her career. And those themes are women and indigenous people. Uh, she became very committed to uh, not only photographing indigenous people, but studying their rituals, uh, collecting their folk art. She uh, uh, collected one of the great folk art collections in Mexico, and um, she really became a scholar. She had a major library um, on, um, on indigenous culture. Uh, so this, this photograph is really key, and we can look at a, at, a, at a few others. We can move on to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, she was very interested in uh, studying uh, ritual. And so she, she traveled all around Mexico to these different processions and fiestas and photographed uh, people as they were celebrating uh, saints days or more indigenous rituals. And she was very interested in these uh, costumes and masks that uh, indigenous people would perform. But you know, these, these photographs are not simply documents. They are on a certain level. But then if we look at this young man who's peering into the camera, we realize that there's kind of different dimensions taking place. There's, there's this performative dimension of the person in costume. And then there's this young boy kind of looking at us, you know, wondering if, you know, is this part of his world? You know, how does he relate to, to this kind of, uh, tradition in his community. We can move on. As I mentioned, uh, women were very important to, to Mariana. So one of the things that she really focused on was this community of uh, Mazawa people uh, in the state of Mexico. So very near Mexico City. And it, it's, it's really a very overlooked community. You know, I think that when we think of indigenous cultures in Mexico, we think of, uh, of uh, Oaxaca or other places uh, south of Mexico City. Uh, maybe because this culture seems a little less exotic, maybe because of its uh, proximity to Mexico City, these people have not really been uh, documented very well. Uh, Jan Polsky began to, to visit uh, Mazawa communities and discovered communities largely of women. Uh, the men had, and this is now we're talking about photographs that she's making in the 1980s. Uh, the men were leaving their families and their villages in search of work. Uh, they, tend, they often became construction workers and they would go to Mexico City or they would come to the United States and often they would not return. They would, they would uh, find new families, they would create new families. So they would leave the women in these villages where they would be quite impoverished. Um, and yet there was a lot of beauty. If we go to the next slide, um, uh, you know, this is called Mazawa ornament. You know, these, these people are impoverished and yet there's, beauty that they create in this environment. And I think she was, was very interested in that, in, in the way that you can find beauty in these impoverished environments. And you know, talking about this lineage that, that kind of goes on and on, um, this is uh, uh, from about 1990, an image of a, a maguey plant. And for me, I just see this very strong echo of Edward Weston. You know, as much as Mariana was so committed to, to women and to the Mazawa culture, she knew these people very, very well. She would go again and again, and they, they knew her and they trusted her. But she also had this other side. She had this strong commitment to, to photography. She had this rigorous sense of composition. She was an amazing craftsperson in terms of printmaking. And I think that you know all that comes through in, in this uh, photograph of a Mangay plant. 
And then let's move to Graciela Iturbide, who represents a, a somewhat uh, younger generation. Graciela was born in the 1940s. Uh, Graciela, um, I think, would now be considered Mexico's greatest photography. You know, Alvarez Bravo has passed, Mariana has passed. Um, Graciela is still quite active and has important bodies of work uh, behind her. So she studied um, photography and filmmaking in the 1970s. She actually studied, studied under Manuel Alvarez Bravo, uh, originally filmmaking, and then she took a photography course with him and became very close with him. Um, so he also became uh, an important influence on her career. We can go to the next slide. Um, early in um, Graciela's career, uh, she began to work for Mexican government agencies, um, uh, agencies that uh, studied and documented indigenous people. And you, you've probably seen this photograph. If, if you've seen the exhibition, you surely have, but it's one of her uh, most famous uh, photographs. And it was made early in her career when she went to Northern Mexico to study the, the, Seri, the Seri people. And uh, it's just, it's just a, this amazing photograph, right? Of this uh, woman with this boom box heading off into this desert landscape. We don't know where she's really headed into. Um, Graciela has recounted taking this picture, how she just came across the scene. There was this interesting level of uh, serendipity in Graciela's work. And she recalls hearing the, the music coming out of the, the boom box. So in a certain sense for her, there was kind of an everydayness to it. You know, it's this young woman with her, with her boom box and her music. Um, but, you know, the woman also seems to be just floating into this atmosphere. You see that we don't see her feet. And I think that it, it, for me, this photo is just so emblematic of what's happening in Mexico, you know, by the 1970s, if not earlier, it's just so illustrative of these clashes between modernity and tradition that happen again and again. We see it with a lot of the photographers coming up um, because it's the reality of Mexico, right? There's these, these traditional communities, they're struggling to maintain their traditions. But on the other hand, you know, they are interested in boom boxes and televisions and, you know, today cell phones. So there's, there's this, uh, often these kinds of surreal juxtapositions that take place. Um, you know, when people are photographing in these indigenous communities. But um, what Graciela really became known for is her work that she did in Huchitan uh, in the far south of Mexico. And this is taking us back to Tehuantepec, uh, where we earlier talked about uh, some of the photographs in this exhibition, this strong matriarchal culture uh, that holds on to this tradition. Uh, this photograph is called uh, Manos Poderosas, or Powerful Hands. And we see these uh, sculptures of hands that are fabricated from these uh, tree branches that kind of roughly have a hand uh, form. Uh, what you see are uh, a grandmother and a child. And that is also another very telling aspect of much of this work that, that Graciela is making in Huchitan. It's very multi-generational because Huchitan is clinging on to its traditions. And the way that it's doing it is because it is passing down from grandparent to grandchild, you know, from mother to daughter. And this, this photograph uh, really reflects that. We can move on. And uh, this image is more of, you know, sort of everyday, everyday life in Huchitan. So, you know, we can imagine that this woman, you know, dressed in the traditional clothing that you would still see in that town. You know, she's probably come back from the marketplace uh, carrying the chicken that will be tonight's dinner. Uh, and this is another hallmark of uh, Graciela's work, this um, frankness about death. I think Graciela often shows death as simply, it's just another side of life. And she, and she treats it very frankly and simply. We can move on. Another very well-known photograph uh, by Graciela, uh, Nuestra Señora de las Iguanas. And this is another photograph where serendipity comes into play. Um, Graciela spent several years in Huchitan. She would go again and again. And she got to know these people. And again, like with Mariana and the Mazawa, these people got to know her, to trust her. It's not, it's not easy to make photographs like this. It, there needs to be a relationship that's developed between the photographer and the, the subject. Um, she's talked about this photograph, about uh, seeing this woman just like this with these iguanas on her head, you know, crowning her head. And she was about to place them down on a counter. She's a marketplace vendor. This is food in Huchitan and Graciela said, wait, I want to photograph you. 
And she realized that she only had a few shots left in her camera. You know, this is back in the day of, of, uh, of film cameras. And I think, you know, so she just was able to make a few photos. And again, there's serendipity, but that's combined with uh, Graciela's true genius to be able to, to capture such a wonderful photograph and also to reveal Alice's life in unexpected ways. You know, she's not sentimentalizing these people, but she's showing the reality of what she saw and we can certainly move on. You know, of all the photographers I've shown you, I realized at one point, these photographers don't leave Mexico. You know, they, they I mean, they do travel, they have exhibitions internationally. Uh, they often come to the United States, but they don't really bring their cameras when they travel. They, they, they are really committed to making their work in Mexico with the exception of, of Graciela. Uh, she's made some uh, interesting bodies of work in, uh, in the United States. Uh, she's worked in Europe and then uh, extensively in India. And I wanted to show you this picture because uh, she made this in, in Benares, India. And if we can go to the next one, or we'll go back to Manuel Alvarez Bravo's photo. I just wondered when she saw the, these eyes if she was thinking about her teachers uh, Optigo Moderna of something like seven dec decades earlier. Um, I think there's a really interest, interesting reference uh, between these two photographs. But we can move on to a, a photographer of an even younger generation, uh, Flor Garduño, who was born in the 1950s. Um, let's, this, is, this is just a portrait of Flor, but we can move on to the next, next photograph. So um, Flor also studies with, uh, with Manuel Alvarez Bravo, although somewhat less formally. She becomes his darkroom assistant and under his tutelage becomes a true master printmaker, uh, one of the best in Mexico, working both with palladium, which is a very difficult uh, printing process as well as in, in black, and, black and white. Um, and of course, she's also a photographer. She's also committed to photographing in indigenous uh, people as well as the landscapes in which they live. They live. So this is one of her fairly early works, uh, Marriage in Sinacantan, which is in the Oaxaca Highlands. And uh, you know, the woman's dress is, is fascinating, right? I mean, you can barely get a glimpse of the woman's face. Both of them are dressed very intricately in you know, very, very traditional dress. And um, you know, I was talking to a, a friend who's a, a folklore specialist uh, about costume, and she told me that these kinds of clothes are are, are very rare, especially today, and they're very expensive. Um, you know, they take the women hours and hours and days and days to make. So, for indigenous people to be able to uh, purchase uh, clothing like this uh, it takes you know a huge amount of of their income, um, and also. Uh, this is in, a, is, is in a community where the people do not like to be photographed. So this is a very rare photograph to see this wedding day, to see these costumes, and to see these people, you know, obviously, you know, cooperating in the act of being, of being photographed. Um, so it's a very rare scene. Now, one of the things that's different about Floor compared to some of the other photographs is that like the wedding scene and like this uh, photograph from the 1990s, of an Aztec warrior is that the photographs are very posed. You know, in this case, you know, she's used this, this wall with all these graffiti markings and uh, you know, this, this kind of light coming in from the side to photograph uh, this man in a very dramatic way. Uh, he's wearing the costume of the Eagle Warrior. This was uh, an, uh, um, an uh, elite Aztec uh, military unit. And, Today, uh, these costumes are worn on fiesta days. Uh, so you see this, this helmet that is also an eagle. And, and, um, but what's also interesting is that, you know, like with Graciela's images of the woman with the boom box, um, there's this incursion of modernity, right? So we have the graffiti and we see the man with his modern uh, boots and modern socks. And so again, we see these surreal juxtapositions playing out even as, um, traditions are being captured as well. And then, as I mentioned, um, she's uh, also been very committed to photographing uh, the landscape where these people live. So this is a tree in Yalalag. So this is that same hilly landscape where Lola Alvarez Bravo captured that mournful wedding possession in the 1940s. What I think is so beautiful about this photograph is not only this lean of the tree and the way that the light hits it, but the, this woman's outstretched arms, which reflects the way that indigenous people respect nature and see it very much as something that they're totally reliant upon for their lives. 
so this is this for me is a very emblematic image of of um, the way that indigenous people treat the environment, which is with a great deal of respect. See, I think is that the end of this group of photographs? Yes, it is. So um, I think we only have a little bit of time, but um, what I wanted to do was to show you a few photographers that are not in the exhibition. Um, Graciela, as I mentioned, is still very active, but she's in her 70s. Uh, Flor Gardunio is nearly there. And they, you know, they represent this amazing lineage, a hundred year lineage of, uh, you know, that begins with Weston and Alvarez Bravo of, you know, this more purist form of photography, working in black and white, uh, working with analog photography, uh, you know, no, um, you know, photographic manipulation. But then this other generation is coming to the fore, of course, and this this newer generation. There's with this newer generation. There's a turn to color. There's a turn to digital photography. There's different forms of manipulation and constructed images. And I would also say a much sort of franker um, communication about political messages. So this is uh, Yolanda Andrade, who was born in the mid 1950s. So very much a contemporary of Flor Garduño but really representing a break, right? I mean, look at these garish colors. Uh, again, these very surreal juxtapositions, but in kind of a very kind of staged theatrical way. Uh, you know, this is probably some sort of performer much in the way that we do the civil right, uh, the, the um, civil war reenactments in the United States. But of course he's, you know, next to this, you know, line of Cokes and other soft drinks. What I think is important to think about though with work like this, on the one hand, it does represent a break but on the other hand, uh, Yolanda is also simply showing something about the Mexican reality today, right? There's a lot of consumerism, globalism, you know, of course, you know, all of all of photography has turned to color. So she's representing something that's, even though there is an element of staged photography here, it's also very real. And, you know, she's also playing with these surreal juxtapositions. We go to the next one. We think about the kinds of surreal juxtapositions that engaged uh, Alvarez Bravo, you know, we see this, the very same thing here, you know, right at Teotihuacan, where Edward Weston photographed uh, that amazing black and white composition of the pyramid. And then we can move on to Daniela Rosell, who's an absolutely uh, unique figure in Mexico. So, you know, I was showing you so many pictures of uh, uh, rural people, indigenous people, you know, and frankly, people that generally live in poverty. Very few photographers in Mexico in the 20th century photographed wealth. A couple did, uh, but it was very uncommon. But here's Daniela Rosell, a photographer who was born in the 1970s. And she is photographing the homes and the lifestyles of uh, literally the rich and the famous. She calls the series the uh, Ricos y Famosas. So she is based in Northern Mexico, uh, which is very industrial, which tends to be uh, quite wealthy. And she's really photographing the 1% the of the 1%. Uh, uh, again, photographing women, primarily the wives and the daughters of these immensely rich industrialists. And I think in terms of interpretation of these photos, you know, we can look at these photos and, and you know, think about the corruption that allows a person to live, live this way. But, uh, what, but what I also see is that the same way that you know, Graciela and Flor and Mariana are, are giving us kind of a window into indigenous life. Uh, Daniela is giving us a window into this, this extreme wealth that also exists in Mexico. So I think it also has an anthropological dimension that connects in a certain way to this whole lineage of Mexican photography that we've been looking at. And then the last photographer I'll show you is Dulce Pinzon. Um, she is uh, also a uh, generation born in the 1970s, very active uh, today. Uh, she made this series around 2005. It's called The Real Story of the Superheroes. And now we're talking about very carefully staged photographs, right? So she's working with subjects to costume them and have them in, you know, in a certain uh, setting to photograph them. So she's working in New York. Uh, photographing uh, migrant workers uh, in their workplace in superhero costumes. And so these, and these people really are superheroes, right? She, there are captions that go along with each, with each photograph that uh, give us their name, where they're from, where they work and how much money that they give back uh, to their, that they remit back to Mexico each week. So if we go to the next one, uh, this man who's a delivery worker, 
he sends back $500 a week to his family in Mexico, which is a staggering sum because I think you know how expensive it is to live in New York and you know these people make very low wages. Um, so I wanna end with this photograph because the other thing that, that Dulce uh, Pinzon's photographs do, is I think they, there is a political message, right? She wants us to think about the way that Mexican migrants are denigrated, how they're invisible. And she wants us to know a little bit about their lives and their values so that we see them in a new light. And so that we can think about this relationship between Mexico and the United States in new ways. And if you've seen the exhibition, you know there are many American photographers who went and went to Mexico to make their work. And so this whole exhibition is, is also about that back and forth between Mexico and the United States. And I think that it's worth uh, thinking about work like this as we think about the future of this relationship uh, between the two countries. So I'm gonna end there. Uh, thank you for listening. And I am happy to answer um, any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was wonderful. I, Thank you. I can see all of the connections now. You really illuminated those between these artists. Um, thank you for the contemporary artists as well, introducing us to a few new names. That can uh, be your next show. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I, I have a few questions and sure. I will just encourage if, you, if anyone who is watching has a question for Elizabeth, please just post that in the Q&A and we'll address those. Um, but you know, I, you mentioned, especially with Mariana's work, and I was thinking about this in terms of printmaking and the way that prints are disseminated. Could you maybe comment, because the political effect of that, right, and the politics of a photograph, the political potential for a photograph um, in the way that it's used. So maybe you could comment a little bit on the exhibition practices for some of these artists, like where did they exhibit? Mm -hmm. How did they share their photographs? I think these are very different in certain cases than like photojournalist work. Right. I mean, all of these, all of these photographers are artists. Although Lola Alvarez Bravo was also a photojournalist, and a lot of her work appeared in in uh, Mexican magazines, sort of the the uh, uh, equivalent of Life and Look, those kinds of illustrated magazines. Uh, but I think that basically for everybody else, yes, they are artists, photographers. You know, for Manuel, it would have been different in the 1920s, although. Uh, there is a small photographic community and there's a couple of, of galleries that are showing uh, photography. I don't know how much photography is being sold, but they're, they're, they're making photographic work. They're, they're, they're publishing books and they're sending their photographs and exhibitions. I mean, Manuel uh, has an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, I think in the early 1930s. Um, there's a famous uh, exhibition, The Family of Man, that I think started in the, the late 1940s and traveled around the world in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, both Manuel Alvarez Bravo and Lola Alvarez Bravo were, were in that. I mean, it was an exhibition and a book, right? The, that book, I mean, I had that book as a kid. There were tens oh, of thousands of, of those books. Uh, and I think that the photo that I showed you, the funeral and Yalalag, was one of the photographs in, 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 in that book. It, it really changes in the 1970s and 80s, you know, when photography begins to be seen as an art form internationally, uh, when there are museums of, photograph of photography that are founded, when people start collecting photography and seeing it as something that has value. So these uh, photographers tend to have a market for their work, not a huge market, but tend to have a market in their work, but it tends to be in the United States. You know, there are photo galleries in New York and LA and San Francisco that will um, have, they'll, 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 they, may they may focus on like Edward Weston, other photographers of the, West, of the West, but then they'll also have Mexican photographers in their stable. So um, that is, um, I think, an interesting aspect of Mexican photography and that the market, I would say, even to this day, tends to be in the United States, although there are a couple of galleries in Mexico that specialize in, in photography. Um, these photog all of these photographers now have a market for their work. They've had museum exhibitions, uh, their prints are collected, and um, it's not the only way that, they're, that, they, that they earn money. Um, you know, unfortunately, the work tends to get much more valuable when they die. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, a, it was at least a decade ago or more uh, of Tina Madodi Rose's Photographs sold at auction for well into six figures. I think at that time it was the highest selling photograph ever 
but you know, I, in Tina's day, I, she probably could not sell a photograph for more than $20. Wow. <laughs> and, and then were there any publications that they, I, I mean, of note that you think? Um, not that early. Not that early. Okay. Uh, and if they were. I, I'm thinking you know, like were, camera work, right? From that period. But I, I don't yeah. know if they were publishing in that. I'm just. There, there were some books. There was an American woman uh, had, who had a, um, a magazine called Mexican Folkways. And uh, Tina, Tina Madoti photographs. So they would, she would send photographers on, on assignments. I want photographs of traditional puppets, or I want photographs of the embroidery work of a certain group in Puebla. And these, these uh, Tina Madoti, uh, and um, also uh, Alvarez Bravo would contribute photographs to these these magazines. You know, and they would make a, a few dollars. But they're not printed very well, right? They're they're in black and white. We're talking about publications from the 1920s and 30s, but they're valued, they're very valuable documents for us to look at uh, today. Absolutely. And we've certainly benefited from the collecting of these artists over time with this Bank yes. of America exhibition. We're very lucky to have that with us now. Um, I don't, I, actually, we have one Q&A uh, from Ida Keller. Was Lola, hi, Ida. Uh, was Lola Alvarez Bravo influenced by Paul Strand? Were any of these artists actually influenced by Paul Strand when he was in Mexico? I think Strand's um, an interesting character. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, and I was, I, I decided to talk about uh, female photographers and I, I was thinking today about, you know, how they made their work and how they, how uh, women photographers have tended to have this kind of empathy for their subjects and this kind of warm approach, non-intimidating approach that made it impossible, that made it possible for them to, to capture these photographs. Because I was also thinking about Paul Strand who took such a different approach, right? When mm -hmm. he went, so he came from America to uh, Mexico and traveled around and he had a trick camera. So he, you know, so he was looking over here but he was actually photographing over there. And, you know, that today is considered an unethical practice but he did, cap he did make some very wonderful photographs in Mexico. Uh, they, they knew, I think they knew Strand, the, the, the photo community was so small in those days that everybody sort of knew everybody. And when there was a visitor or a newcomer or somebody coming from abroad, that person was able to pretty easily enter, enter that community. So Weston getting to know everybody and, you know, or, or Strand coming and traveling around and getting to know people. So um, I don't think that Strand was a direct influence, but I think that they, cer they certainly knew him. Sure. And, you know, we're at time, but I wanted to close and maybe ask you to describe your book, your new book. Thank you. Yes. So Latinx photography in the United States. Uh, so it takes a, a different turn. It's photographers here in the United States. So Mexican-American photographers, uh, Puerto Ricans, Cuban-Americans, other Latin Americans that have long been based in the United States. Uh, I look at about 80 photographers, almost from the beginning of the history of photographer photography to the present day, really focusing on the civil rights movement onward. And, you know, I wrote, I wrote the book because the more and more that I worked on Mexican photography, I realized that these photographers close to home are also neglected. And, you know, there had never been such a book. Um, it's not really taught in college courses. It's not really collected by museums. Uh, so I spent several years doing research and uh, it's an introduction. You know, I hope that it, it spurs more work, more research, uh, more college courses. And, uh, you know, if, I hope you all take a look at that book as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And if there's thank a place so where we can purchase your book. Uh, Amazon. Okay. All right. <laughs> University of Washington Press. Got it. Well, thank you so, so much for spending your time and sharing your insights thank you. this evening. Thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Yes. Thank you. And have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.